بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد كتاب المغازي باب غزوة العشيرة أو العسيرة قال ابن إسحاق أول ما غزا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الأبواب ثم بواب ثم العشيرة وبه قال حدثني عبد الله بن محمد قال حدثنا وهب قال حدثنا شعبة عن أبي إسحاق كنت إلى جنب زيد بن أرقم فقيل له كم غزا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من غزوة قال تسعة عشرة قيل كم غزوت أنت معه قال سبع عشرة قلت فأيهم كان كانت أول قال العشير أو العسيرة فذكرت لقتادة فقال العشيرة صدق رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد كلما ذكره الذاكرون وصل على سيدنا مولانا محمد كلما غفل عن ذكره الغافلون اللهم صل وسلم على عبدك ورسولك اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد أفضل سلواته Tonight is the first Friday after the blessed month of Ramadan and it is the first verse of hadith after the month of Ramadan and I personally felt the absence of this throughout the month of Ramadan and Alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the ability to get back to this verse of hadith this blessed series of hadith sessions so far we have covered many chapters from this Sahih al-Bukhari Sahih al-Bukhari is the most authentic book on the surface of this earth after Quran and that is by the consensus of all the scholars there's no second opinion about that after the Quran the most authentic book on the surface of this earth is this book Sahih al-Bukhari every hadith that has been mentioned in this book that has been recorded in this book meets the highest standard set by the scholars set by the scientists of hadith and another amazing thing about each hadith recorded in this book is that Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi, who's the compiler of this book He has mentioned himself that before I inserted any hadith into this book, first of all, he did his investigation to find out whether the hadith meets the standard or not, whether the hadith is authentic or not. Once he was certain that the hadith meets that standard, the highest standard that he has set amongst the scholars of hadith, once he was certain that the hadith meets that standard, then before he would write the hadith into the book, he said, I would make ghusl, not just wudu. I would make ghusl, I would take a full bath to cleanse myself, to purify myself, and then I would perform two rak'ah of nafal, and then I would put the hadith into this book. And this book has a little over 7,000 ahadith. So this, this book has many distinct and unique attributes, unique qualities. And this is one of them that the author, before recording any hadith, before writing any hadith into this book, he obviously made sure that the hadith is authentic and meets the standard, but he would take a full bath and then he would perform two rak'ah of nafal prayer and then he would put the hadith into the book. 
So Alhamdulillah, we have covered many parts of this book. We have not, we have not gone from cover to cover, but selectively we have, Alhamdulillah, covered many important sections of this book. We have covered some sections of Kitab al-Salah, the book, of, uh, the chapter of prayer. We have covered some sessions, some sections of Kitab al-Sawm, the book of fasting. We have covered some sections of Kitab al-Hajj, the book of the book of pilgrimage. We have covered some sections of Kitab al-Nikah. We have covered some sections of Kitab al -Hubub. We have covered some sections of Kitab al Kitab Kitab Bad al Khalq, the beginning of creation. We have covered some sections about the Book of Prophets. So we have covered many sections of the Surah selectively from here and there. And today as we begin this new, new series inshallah, I would like to take you to an important part of life of Rasulullah that the scholars call Ghazawat. In this book, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi has called it Maghazi. Maghazi is the plural of Maghza and Ghazawat, which is more commonly known among the people, is the plural of Ghazwa. Both refer to the same thing. The battles in which the Prophet wasallam himself <laughs> participated or the battle campaigns in which the Prophet wasallam himself participated. And roughly, there are at least 17 of them. According to one report, there are 19. According to one report, there are 21. And according to one report, there are 27. But even if you take the smallest number, that means the Prophet ﷺ spent a major chunk of his life in Medina in these campaigns, outside of the home. And if you, if you calculate the life that the Prophet ﷺ spent in Mecca after he, was, he became Prophet of Allah was 13 years. And in that period, there was no fighting at all. Muslims were not allowed to fight. They were not allowed to fight back. They were not allowed to. Uh, they were not allowed to uh, take any action. They were only being taught to endure, 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 and be patient. When they arrived into Medina, that's when Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala permitted them. And the ayah came down in Surah Al-Hajj, where Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala said, "Udina lil-ladina yuqataruna bi annahum ghulim." And according, as I mentioned in one of the <coughs> brief talks in Taraweeh prayer, Surah Al-Hajj, basically according to the authentic opinion, the revelation of Surah Al-Hajj started in Mecca, but it completed in Medina. So these ayat were revealed either during the journey of the Prophet ﷺ as he was coming into Medina, or soon after he arrived into the blessed city of Medina. So this surah is a disputed surah. Some scholars say it is a Makki surah, some say it is a Madni surah, and some say it is, uh, it is half Makki, half Madni. Some say some verses are Makki and some verses are Madni. And that's true. Not, you can't say the entire half is Makki or entire half is Madni. You can't say all of it is Makki or all of, it, all of it is Madni. The true opinion, the authentic opinion is that some verses are Makki because they were revealed before the migration and some re were revealed after the migration. So in this surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down this ayah That those who were wronged, those who were oppressed, those who were fought with, they have been given permission to fight back. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ and surely Allah is able and competent in helping them against their enemy, against their offenders. So this was the first ayah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted the fighting. Now as the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ lived nearly 10 years in Medina. 
in these 10 years, there was, there was basically not even a single year in which he would not have to go out and fight in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to either defend themselves from their enemies as was the case in Uhud, as was the case in Ahzab, in Quraida, and other battles and sometimes it was to, to, uh, to curb the disorder, the mischief that, that was being spread in the earth and the purpose with all of that was to raise the word of Allah. إِعْلَاءُ كَلِمَةِ اللَّهِ and that's, the, and that's the only acceptable fight in the path of Allah. If someone fights in the path of Allah, so, the Allah, so Allah's word could be higher than the words of his enemies, then that fight is the fight for the sake of Allah. If someone fights for any other reason, that is not the fight for the sake of Allah. That is a fight for national reasons, for, uh, for uh, tribal reasons, for wealth, for political reasons, and for any other reason. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ قَاتَلَ لِتَكُونَ كَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِي الْعُلْيَا فَهُوَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Only that person is truly in the path of Allah who fights in the path of Allah so the word of Allah can remain higher than the word of his shaykh, than the word of shaykh. So, we will <coughs> go on this uh, go on to this chapter of Imam Bukhari Rahmatullahi Alayhi known as Kitab al -Mahazim. In this chapter, Imam Bukhari Rahmatullahi Alayhi basically uh, takes us to those ahadith which teach us about the battles in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam participated. And as I mentioned, there are either 17, 19, 21 or 27. And if you divide these, let's say the, the least number is 17. If you spread it over a 10 year period, that means the Prophet ﷺ was going out more than once every year. And if you take the, the number 19 or 21, that means the Prophet ﷺ was going out basically twice every year. And if you take the number 27, that means the Prophet ﷺ was going out in the path of Allah every four months. Every four months, he would, on average, every four months, he would have to go out on some occasion, on some battle campaign. And this, this is why it is a major chunk of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And we must be aware of it. We must know it. And it was an important part of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam <coughs> was doing that in order to spread the truth in order to establish the word of Allah, in order to establish the kalima of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and in order to fill the world with justice. So the shaitan becomes weaker and Allah's word becomes stronger. This was the goal that the Prophet sallallahu was pursuing. And the Prophet sallallahu set many rules for the warfare that no human civilization had ever introduced or, or had ever obeyed. This is why if you look at the army of the Prophet Sallallahu they were best of the best. They were the best and exemplary, most exemplary human beings and the best people. They never harmed any woman. They never, never harmed any children. They never harmed any elderly person. They did not even bother to disturb any person who was not participating in the battle. And today we see those countries that claim to be so civilized, that, that claim to be so, uh, so uh, caring, they're the ones who are killing children, they're the ones who are killing women, they're the ones who are creating havoc and dis dis and destroying everything that, that they can just because they have the power. They have no fear of Allah. They have no fear of reckoning. They have no fear of judgment. They have no fear of being questioned after death. Just because they 
possess the power, they're using their power blindly to inflict as much pain, as much harm, as much destruction on the innocent people as much as they can. You can pick up any book on the seerah. And the scholar whose name will be mentioned now, Ibn Ishaq rahmatullahi alayhi, he is the foremost authority on the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in terms of maghazi, in terms of ghazwa. He is the foremost authority. He has the most knowledge. You can read his book. He has compiled a book. And you can read any other book. And you will learn that never in the history the Prophet Sallallahu army, the Prophet Sallallahu soldiers, the Prophet Sallallahu companions ever did anything even that could be considered despicable. They were always the most respectful. And they were always the most obedient. And they were always, always the most caring. So this is a chapter of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that now we will explore inshallah in a few weeks after it will continue after this because first we will learn about the names of few ghazawat that you probably have never heard about because most people understand that the the battle's history in the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam begins from badr ghazwat badr the battle of badr but that's not the case so Battle of Badr was a major battle, the first major battle in Islam. And then there was Uhud, then there was Ahzab, then there was Badr Mustala, then there was Khaybar, then there was the conquest of Mecca, then there was a battle of Hunayn and Taif, and then last there was the battle of Tabu. So all these are lengthy, lengthy campaigns that the Prophet ﷺ undertook and none of them were easier. In none of these battles, Muslims were uh, uh, financially capable in terms of uh, in terms of in in terms of their finances. Nor the times were easy. They were always difficult, and this is why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "Inna Allah ashtara min al-mu'minin anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al-jannah yuqatiluna fi sabil Allah, fayaktuluna wa yuqtalun." Because going out in the path of Allah and fighting in the path of Allah is not something easy. It always comes with hardship. So the first ghazwa, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi calls it Babu ghazwatil Ushayra awil Ushayra. Ushayra awil Ushayra. It is either called Ushayra or Ushayra. This was a place, it was, the, the place was called Ushayra or Ushayra. The, the correct opinion is Ushayra and the scholars have verified it. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi has mentioned both that it is possible that it is Usayra or it is also possible that it is Usayra. But the scholars have verified that it is Usayra. This was a place near the modern day city called Yambo in Medina, uh, in Saudi Arabia. The city is basically on the coast of Red Sea. It's about roughly 150 kilometers from the blessed city of Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ went there in the first year of Hijrah. So as the reason I mentioned to you a little bit background of the Hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ, because right from the first year, the Prophet ﷺ undertook some minor battle campaigns. These were not major. But we need to understand why the scholars have included this also in Ghazawat or in Maghazi is because any battle in which the Prophet ﷺ participated, whether it was small or big, it is called Ghazwa. So there were in total 17 or 19 or 21 or 27 in which the Prophet ﷺ personally himself participated. Any battle in which the Prophet ﷺ did not participate, rather he sent someone else and appointed another, another person to be the commander, to be the leader, that is called Sariya. And the pl plural of Sariya is Saraya. And there were many uh, that are known as Saraya, as Sariya battles as well, in which the Prophet ﷺ himself did not participate for one reason or the other, but he sent someone else uh, to lead the army, and they went uh, you know, as, as the army of the Prophet ﷺ. 
ابن اسحاق قال ابن اسحاق اول ما غزا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الابواب ثم بواب ثم العشيرة ابن اسحاق who is the authority on the chapter on the discussion of the غزوات of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said that the very first battle that the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم fought was known as the battle of abwab غزوتُ الابواب and this was also named after a place if you look at the if you look at the battles of Islam, they're mostly named after the places where they were fought. Ghazwatu Badr is, is named after the place it was fought in Badr. And you can go and visit the field of Badr even today, the ground of Badr. Now it's a city. Uhud was fought in the Uhud area where the mountain of Uhud is. And Khandaq is the Ghazwat Khandaq, the battle of trenches, was the battle fought where the trench was dug around the city of Medina. And Ghazwat Tabuk was fought where Tabuk is today, is the, is the northmost city of Saudi Arabia. And the, the conquest of Mecca obviously took place in Mecca. Hunayn took place in Hunayn. Ghazwat Taif took place in Taif. So most of these battles are named after the places. So Abawa is another battle, which was a small one. The Prophet ﷺ maybe had with him uh, maybe 75 or, or 70 people. And he went to basically uh, intercept a caravan. As, was, uh, as has been explained by, uh, by other scholars and other historians, so Abwa was a place also near the coast, and that's where this uh, this battle took place. And there were there were no casualties on either side. Basically, it was an escape. So Abwa, then there was another small battle, and that was at the place called Bula. And then the third one is Ushayra, which is referenced in the title, the Ghazwatul Ushayra or Ushayra. وبه قال حدثني عبد الله بن محمد قال حدثنا وهب قال حدثنا شعبة عن أبي إسحاق كنت إلى جنب زيد بن أرقم أبو إسحاق said that I was on the side of زيد بن أرقم رضي الله عنه who was a companion of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم فقيل له he was asked كم غزى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من غزوة how many battles did the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم participate in he said 19. Then whoever was asking question, he said, In how many battles did you participate with the Prophet? He said, I participated in 17 of them. So then this person asked Zayd bin Arqam which one of the battles was the first one? So Zayd al Arqam said, Al Ushair or Al Usaira. It was either Ushair or Usaira, the same battle. This was the first one in the life of the Prophet. So this person, after this, he went to Qatada and he asked the same question he, to make sure whether it was Ushaira or Usair. So Qatada said it was Ushair. The correct name is Ushaira, and that was the first in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. After these small campaigns, there comes the major, major battle, which is known as the Battle of Badr or Ghazwatu Badr. This is the first major battle in the history of Islam. And this is also the major battle because this is a battle which was, which was, given as a decisive victory to Islam and to Muslims. This battle proved to the kuffar that Muslims are not someone that you can simply override and you can simply get rid of. Islam is something that has <coughs> begun to grow and it will continue to grow and you will never be able to stop it. This was a battle that proved that to the kuffar of Mecca and basically it set alarms throughout the Arabian Peninsula that Islam has now emerged, it has now arrived and it will grow and it will continue to grow and no force will ever be able to stop it.
This was the message and this is why this is known as Yom al furqan as well. This is known as the, the day of criterion, the day of decision in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the decision to prove the superiority of Islam over all others. Now we will start talking about Badr, what happened in Badr, how did it happen, what was the, what was the context in which the battle of Badr took place, and how did the Prophet ﷺ prepare for it, how did the Prophet ﷺ decide to arrive in Badr, and why did it come up in Badr, and also uh, who, was, uh, who was killed from the side of Kuffar of Mecca, and then who were the martyrs from the side of Muslims? Muslims lost some people as well, and Kuffar lost more. Kuffar lost about 70 people, and Muslims lost, lost about 13 people. If you, if you go to the, the battlefield of Badr today, it's all enclosed now. You, you, you cannot go inside unless you have permission, unless the, the, the guard on the gate gives you permission to go inside. But outside of that gate, there is a huge board that maybe the Saudi authorities have erected. And on that board, you see the names of the 13 companions of the Prophet ﷺ who died in that battle. These were the martyrs. These were the first martyrs of Islam, the first shuhada of Islam. And in that list, there are two brothers who also were martyred and they were young brothers young companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, this chapter that Imam Bukhari <coughs> is mentioning, Babu Dhikr Nabi Chapter regarding the names of those people or the mentioning of those people by the Prophet ﷺ who will be killed in Badr. The Prophet ﷺ had informed the Sahaba from time to time, not in a collective manner, but individually. The Prophet ﷺ sometimes would disclose and he would tell someone that, you know, this person will be killed in Badr. This person will be killed in Badr. And one of the, one of the guys whose name was mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ to Sa'd radiallahu anh, Umayyah. So the Prophet ﷺ told uh, Sa'd radiallahu anh, that Umayyah will be killed. And now listen to the story. What happens here? The hadith is narrated by Abu Ishaq. He says that Amr bin Maymun told me that he heard Abdullah bin Mas'ud He was telling a story of, about Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad who was one of the leaders of Medina, one of the leaders of Ansar. <coughs> so Sa'ad bin Mu'ad was telling a story. He said, Sa'ad bin Mu'ad had friendship with Umayyah, Umayyah bin Khalaf. And whenever Umayyah would come to Medina, he would become the guest of Sa'ad bin Mu'ad. Likewise, when Sa'ad bin Mu'ad would go to Mecca, he would become the guest of Umayyah. وَكَانَ أُمَيَّةَ إِذَا مَرَّ بِالْمَدِينَةَ نَزَلَ عَلَى سَعْدٍ وَكَانَ سَعْدٍ إِذَا مَرَّ بِمَكَّةَ نَزَلَ عَلَى أُمَيَّةَ فلما قدم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم المدينة انطلق سعد معتمرا. So after the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم moved into Medina, he settled in Medina with complete migration. Once سعد رضي الله عنه he decided to go for Umrah to مكة. He went for Umrah. That means the Umrah was being done even before Hajj. Hajj became obligatory in the ninth year of Hijrah. But here. Sa'd is going for Umrah in the first or in the beginning of the second year of Hijrah. So Sa'd went to Mecca to perform Umrah. And there, obviously, he becomes the guest of his friend Umayyah, Umayyah bin Khalaf. So he said to Umayyah, because Umayyah was one of the leaders of Mecca, Umayyah was one of the tribal leaders in Mecca. So Sa'd radiallahu asked Umayyah, why don't you find some time for me where there's no one around the Kaaba so I can go and make tawaf around the Kaaba. 
I do not want to be disturbed. I just want to go in peace and go make the tawaf around the Kaaba. So why don't you find some time when there's no one around so I can go and make tawaf? فَخَرَجَ بِهِ قَرِيبًا مِنْ نِسْفِ النَّهَارِ So Umayyah took Sa'ad رضي الله عنه to, uh, to allow him to make tawaf of the house of Allah around noon time. That's when, because it was heat, so nobody was there. Nobody was there to make tawaf at that time. It was empty. So Umayyah took Sa'ad رضي الله عنه at that time to Kaaba and he, uh, he allowed Sayyidina Sa'ad رضي الله عنه to make tawaf. فَلَقِيَهُوَا أَبُو جَهَلْ Abu Jahl met with them. By the way, Abu Jahl is the name that the Prophet ﷺ gave to this person. And the meaning of Abu Jahl is father of ignorance. His actual name was Abu Hakam. He used to call himself Abu Hakam, the father of wisdom. The Prophet ﷺ called him the father of ignorance. So he used to call himself and he would like to be referred to as Abu Hakam, Abu Hakam. And the Prophet ﷺ gave him the opposite of that. And the Prophet ﷺ would always remember him as Abu Jahl, Abu Jahl. And so did Sahaba. And so do all the Muslims. All the Muslims remember him as Abu Jahl. No one remembers him as Abu Hakam. فَلَقِيَهُمَا Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl met with Safwan, uh, uh, met with uh, Sayyidina Sa'd bin Mu'ad radiallahu an and Umayyah. <clears throat> فَقَالْ يَا أَبَا Safwan. Umayyah was known as Abu Sufyan, uh, uh, Abu Safwan or Abu Safwan as a respectful title. People in Arabia would be called, would like to be called with a title like Abu Fulan, Abu Fulan. So Abu Jahl liked to be called Abu Al-Hakam and Umayyah was known as Abu Safwan. So Abu Jahl said to Umayyah, Ya Abu Safwan, O Abu Safwan, Man hadha ma'a? Who is this man with you? فَقَالْ هَذَا سَعَدْ So, Abu, uh, so Umayyah said, This is Sa'ad from Medina. <coughs> فَقَالْ لَهُ أَبُو جَهَلْ Upon that, Abu Jahl said, أَلَا أَرَاكَ تَطُوفُ بِمَكَّ آمِنَةً Don't I see that you are making tawaf in Mecca in peace? وَقَدْ آوَيْتُمْ أَسْصُبَاتِ while you are the ones who have given refuge to, to the people who have abandoned the religion. So Abu Jahl used to call the Prophet ﷺ Sabi, meaning someone who has abandoned the religion of his forefathers. And Sabi is the word that Allah has used in Quran for those people who have gone away, who have, who have lost the right path. So he used to consider himself on the right path and consider the Prophet ﷺ on the wrong path. So he said, aren't you guys the ones who have given refuge to Muhammad ﷺ and his people? And he referred to, referred to them as subat, misguided people, lost people. And you think that you are going to help them and you are going to assist them? Ama wallahi, lawla anna kama'a abi safwan, ma raja'ta ila ahlika salima. Then he threatened Sa'ad radiallahu anhu. Abu Jahl is threatening. He said, I swear by Allah, if you were not a guest of Abu Safwan or Umayyah, you would not have gone, you would not have returned from Mecca to your home in Medina in a good condition. We would have beaten you up. فَقَالَ لَهُ سَعْدْ وَرَفَعَ صَوْتَهُ عَلَيْهُ Sa'ad رضي الله عنه He became upset and he responded to Abu Jahl and he raised his voice. He said, أَمَا وَاللَّهِ لَإِنْ مَنَعْتَ لِهَذَا لَأَنَّ عَنَّكَ مَا هُوَ أَشَدَّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ تَرِيقَكَ عَلَى الْمَدِينَةِ So Sa'ad رضي الله عنه said, I swear by Allah, if you stop me from making the tawaf of this house today, I will stop you from something that will be harder for you and difficult for you, more difficult for you, your road to Medina. Because these people would go to Sham, would go to Syria only through Medina. They had to pass through Medina. And these people, the Muslims had every authority in Medina, outside of Medina, to stop that. 
And if they stopped it, their tijara, their business would stop. Their caravans would not be able to move safely. And this would create a huge problem for the people of Mecca. So Sa'ad threatened him back by saying, if you stop me from this, we will stop you from that. And since he raised his voice, Umayyah said to Sa'ad La tarfa'a sawtaka ya Sa'ad ala abil hakam sayyidi ahl al wadi. O Sa'ad, don't raise your voice on this man because he is the leader, Abu al-Hakam, he is the leader of this town. He is the chief of this town. So don't <coughs> raise your voice on him. And what does Sa'ad say after that? Sa'ad al-Yalam said, Da'na anka ya Umayya. Leave us alone Umayya. Let us have the conversation. And then he said, Fa wallahi laqad sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul innahum qatiluk. He said, I swear by Allah, I heard the Prophet ﷺ saying that they will kill you. Meaning, the people of Medina will kill you. And this was being addressed to Umayyah. And this is, this is what happens to Umayyah right away. He said, Be Makkah? Are they going to kill me in Makkah? Right away, he realized that whatever Muhammad ﷺ said, it is true. There's no doubt about it. So he does, he does not laugh it off. He does not make, a, make fun of it. Instead, he becomes serious suddenly. And he says, are they going to kill me in Makkah? Be Makkah? Ala la adri. Sa'ad al said, I don't know if they're going to kill me in Makkah or somewhere else. فَفَزِعَ لِذَلِكَ أُمَيَّا فَزْعًا شَدِيدًا And this made Umayyah really terrified. Really, really terrified. And he became really scared after that. فَلَمَّا رَجَعَ أُمَيَّا إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ So now after all of this, when Umayyah came back to his home, he said, يَا أُمَّ صَفْمَان Oh, he said to his wife, Oh, أُمَّ صَفْمَان أَلَمْ تَرَى مَا قَالَ لِي سَعْدِ Do you know what Sa'ad said to me? فَقَالَتْ وَمَا قَالَ لَكْ وَمَا قَالَ لَكْ She said, what did Sa'ad say to you? Then Umayyah said, زَعَمَا أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا صلى الله عليه وسلم أَخْبَرَهُمْ أَنَّهُمْ قَاتِلِيًّا He said, Sa'ad told me that Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم told his people that they are going to kill me. فَقُلْتُ لَهُ بِمَكَّةِ So then he said, I asked Sa'ad, are they going to kill me in Mecca? So Sa'ad رضي الله said, I don't know. لا أدري. I do not know. فَقَالَ أُمَيَّةً at that time, Umayyah thought that it was going to happen in Makkah. So here is what Umayyah said. He said, Wallahi la akhruju min Makkah. I swear by Allah, from today I will never leave Makkah. I will never leave from my home. Because he believed in it that they will kill me. Because Muhammad said it. And if Muhammad said it, that cannot be turned out. That, that cannot turn out to be a lie. He believed in it. He said, I swear by Allah, I will never leave Makkah again. But here's what happens. When it was the day for Badr, Istanfara Abu Jahal and Nas. Abu Jahal asked all the people to get out and go to, go to Badr, to go to Medina, to fight the Muslims and kill them once for all. This is what Abu Jahal said. Qala adriku irakum. And Abu Jahal told people in order to motivate them, he said, Go save your caravan, save your caravan, save your merchandise. Because a caravan of Kuffar of Mecca was being led by Abu Sufyan, who was coming back from Sham with all the merchandise. And they were afraid that Muslims might intercept it and they might take all the merchandise. So Abu Jahl was saying to his people in Mecca, Oh people, let's go, let's arm ourselves and let's save our caravan. From being attacked. And all the people were ready and they were basically ready to leave. And when they were all ready to leave, Umayyah rem rem remembered that and he disliked. He said, No, I cannot go. I will not leave Makkah. Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl came to Umayyah. They were friends. So Abu Hakam is coming to Abu Safwan and he said, Ya Abu Safwan. O Abu Safwan, إِنَّكَ مَتَى يَرَاكَ النَّاسِ قَدْ تَخَلَّفْتَ وَأَنْتَ سَيِّدُ أَهْلِ الْوَالِ تَخَلَّفُ مَعَكَ 
Oh Abu Safman, if you are going to stay behind and you are the leader of this town, the leader of these people, when people will see that you are leaving behind, then people will step back as well and they will stay behind, they will not go either. فَلَمْ يَزَلْ بِهِ أَبُوْ جَهْلٍ حَتَّى قَالْ أَمَّا إِذَا غَلَبْتَنِي فَوَاللَّهِ لَأَشْتَرِيَنَّ أَجْوَدَ بَعِيرٍ بِمَكَّةٍ Abu Jahl continued to remind him, continued to insist him that he should go, he should go, he should go until he said, I swear by Allah, if you win, then I will buy you the most expensive camel in Makkah. And then, Thumma qala Umayyah said, he, he said to his wife, Ya Umma Safan, Jahizin. He, he was convinced by Abu Jahl, so he said to his wife, Oh, Umm Safwan, pack my bag. That's what Jahizini means. Pack my bag, I'm gonna go in the fight. I'm gonna go in the battle. So his wife reminded him, Ya Abu Safwan, Waqad Nasita ma qala laka akhuk al yathribi. Oh, Abu Safwan, oh, Umayyah, did you forget what your brother from Medina said to you? Saad, remember what he said to you? You forgot about it? Qala. At that time, Umayyah said, No, I did not forget about it. Ma uridu an ajuza ma'ahum illa khariba. He said, I'm going, to, I'm going to leave, I'm going to go with them for a little and then I will come back. I'm not going to go all the way. I'll just go a few kilometers, few miles, and once I find some escape, I'll come back. Falamma kharaja Umayyah, akhada la yatruku manzilan illa akala ba'ira. Now, <coughs> when they started moving, Umayyah, every time they would stop, he would get ready to go back. But somehow, when the, when the caravan would move forward, he would have to move forward as well. And he could not find a, a time to escape. فَلَمْ يَزَلْ بِذَلِكْ حَتَّى قَتَلَهُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ And he continued to move on onto his journey until he arrived at Badr and then the fight, the battle of Badr took place and that's where he died. Allah killed him. Allah killed him at Badr because the word of the Prophet ﷺ had to be true. So even these kuffar, they believed in each and every word of the Prophet ﷺ, but they resisted the call of the Prophet ﷺ for their own self interest for their own pity reasons but they believe from the bottom this man Umayyah bin Khalaf he believed in the word of the Prophet ﷺ until last minute he knew but when Allah has to do something Allah will do it Allah had to bring him out Allah brought him out because he was supposed to die in Badr so Allah brought him out of Mecca brought him into Badr and that's where he died so this is basically one picture of the story of Badr and then you will uh, listen to more of it inshallah. Uh, much of it is mentioned in Quran by the way. In, uh, in Surah Al-Anfal much of the story of Badr is mentioned and also uh, some of it is mentioned in, su in Surah Ali Imran and some other places as well. So much of the story of Badr, the battle of Badr is mentioned in Quran and then a lot of it is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Any questions? <coughs> What do you mean? Where do they get those, those suicide They get it from... Uh... They're misguided. Okay. You, you, have to, you have to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet all the way. And these are things that the Prophet never allowed. The Prophet never allowed what... You know, in, in the modern warfare, they have a term. They call collateral damage. What collateral damage means? That, you know, when we will fight, 
there will always be casualties, there will always be innocent people, there will always be civilians, there will always be women and children who will die. And this happens with all of these armed forces. They do that. And they call it collateral damage. In Islam, we don't have a concept of collateral damage. We don't, we don't believe that if this person has to die, then with him, three others will also die. All this is haram. Well, if, if the country is, you know, being defended uh, on the legal grounds, then that fight would be permissible, but not, it will not be for the sake of Allah. The, the, the battles that the Prophet ﷺ fought, you can pick any one of them, and there was no battle that was uh, exclusively, exclusively done to, uh, you know, grab more land, more pieces of land, or to expand the territory, or to uh, establish uh, their their governance on some area. None of that was true. It was done purely for the sake of Allah. That's why when the law of Allah was being violated in any way, they moved back. There was one story uh, in the time of Sayyidina Muawiyah when he was the Amir, when he was the Amir al Mu'minin. In his time, there was a truce between the Muslims and the Romans. And the Muslims, they thought that it is acceptable and it is permissible within the time of truce that they should keep getting the forces closer to the border and then when the truce expires, they will immediately attack their enemy, their adversaries, and, and acquire more land and more victories. And that's exactly what they did. They, they started bringing the soldiers closer to the border, as many as they could. And the moment the truce expired, they did not break the truce. But the moment the truce expired, they attacked the enemy, and they were successful in their strategy. They grabbed a lot of land, they acquired a lot of land, and they conquered many towns, many villages, and they were going on and on. Because the others were not ready, they were not expecting this. So when they had conquered many villages and many towns, they hear a horse rider coming very fast towards the commander of that army commander of that Muslim army. And what he was saying, Ibadullah, Ibadullah, Qifu, Qifu, O people, O servants of Allah, stop, stop, stop. Until he reached the, the commander. And when he reached the commander, he said, Wafa'un You must, you must fulfill your, the, the conditions of your truth the conditions of your promise and you do not break your promise. Do not break your promise. And then they asked him, this was a companion of the Prophet And they asked him, why are you saying this? What did we do wrong? He said, I heard the Prophet saying that if you have a truce between yourself and your enemy, then do not violate the terms of truce unless you have openly openly informed each other that you are terminating this truth. And then you can move forward. What you did, even though you did not openly terminate, you did not openly violate the terms